very good evening one and all what a what a fantastic evening the reason is it is it's a great honor for me dr vijay kumar the webinar coordinator of cci okay to start this new innings next level innings of cci today we have come out with very very unique topic that is muco occlusive diseases and the role of opep device or aerobica in our day to day clinical practice so more importantly just two days ago entire india has celebrated pongal and uh, pong, uh, i'm sorry uh, ugadi ugadi is the actual new year which which people celebrate across india and uh, in various parts of india it is called as baisakhi in punjab chaitra navratri in gujarat and western part of the country and gudi padwa in maharashtra ugadi in southern part particularly karnataka and andhra pradesh vishu in kerala putandu in tamil nadu so interestingly for tamil nadu the new year starts two weeks later the conventional new year across india ponna sankranti in orissa nababasha in west bengal and goru bihu in assam and in this new year with our dedication from our chair founder chair krishnana okay cci has taken its leaps into a newer level by interacting with different company companies and today we our host company is lupin thank you lupin and looking forward for a really long term association another great thing today is eid ramadan across india muslim brothers and sisters and families they celebrate ramadan very much eid mubarak to all my muslim brothers sisters across india without wasting much time today's uh, today's webinar i'll i'll start into introducing the topic and also introducing the panelists before introducing the topic i would love to introduce my esteemed panel here dr kulbi singh sir is senior specialist district at district hospital jodhpur and alid hospital at dr sn medical college jodhpur welcome dr kulbi singh bai dr ajay lanjavar very good friend of mine and is a guide and teacher since 2015 to the eng pulmonologist and currently working as a professor in mgm ms sevagram welcome dr ajay dr sweta bansal a happy soul good friend and uh, currently working as a senior consultant at narayana health gurgaon welcome dr sweta last but not least most important from dibrugarh my dear friend mruganka madhav mishra currently working as an assistant professor department of pulmonary medicine assam medical college and hospital dibrugarh welcome dr mruganka so today if we see the current today's topic muco obstructive lung disease it's relatively newer terminology in pulmonology 
and uh, which is associated with various diseases of the respiratory tract characterized by thickening of the mucus or increased production of the mucus or decreased function of the cilia cilia plays a very very crucial role in clearing of the mucus and debris in the airway so various pathophysiological mechanism leading to this kind of a uh, um, mucus delay in clearance leading to lot of inflammation and infection and uh, some diseases which we are going to discuss in detail today is copd non cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis primary ciliary dyskinesia and though the incidence of cystic fibrosis in india is less we will discuss the role of um, various pharmacotherapy mechanisms and uh, various devices particularly aerobica we will be uh, dealing today without wasting much time the today's flow will be first dr kulbi bai will deliver a talk on basics and then role of various interventions will be dealt by uh, dr shweta me i will talk on uh, the role of aerobica and what is the evidence behind it and then we'll go for panel discussion i request pulmonologists physicians hundreds in number sitting across india without hesitation please drop your queries and we'll be happy to take your queries with our esteemed panel thank you first of all i should thank uh, chess council of india uh, for giving me this opportunity to present my presentation i should also thank dr uh, vijay kumar our moderator of this uh, session for giving me this opportunity the topic of my presentation is pathophysiology of mucociliary clearance and factors affecting it myself dr kulbir singh chopra pulmonary medicine md from jodhpur rajasthan as you can see this diagram of mucociliary transport transport it is self explanatory you can see this mucus layer then there is a periciliary liquid ciliated cells goblet cells basal cells and basement membrane this is the self explanatory diagram in which mucociliary transport is shown how it occurs mucociliary clearance is an innate defense mechanism that protect pulmonary system from harmful consequences of the inhaled agents uh, like uh, biological chemical or physical nature the particle deposited in the ciliated airway are cleared by mucociliary clearance escalator within 24 to 48 hours the mucociliary clearance is affected by many factors as we will discuss discuss it later on for example in asthma the mu airway mucociliary clearance is impaired in asthma disease normal slowing of the mucus clearance in night is more pronounced in asthma patients this could be contributory factor in nocturnal asthma the mechanism underlying this could be increased airway airway inflammation abnormal mucus production and ciliary activity in cystic fibrosis there is reduced chloride and water content in mucus making it abnormally viscous thus reducing clearance and encouraging bacterial colonization we can see the uh, colonization by pseudomonas bacteria in such cases which is more common in inflammatory airway diseases there is hypertrophy of mucus glands and increased viscous secretion which causes decrease mucus clearance we will discuss this uh, uh, diseases later on primary ciliary dyskinesia this is a congenital condition in which ciliary ultrastructure is abnormal many pathogens like haemophilus influenza pseudomonas they can reduce the beat frequency of cilia and other factor which affect uh, ciliary uh, escalator yeah this 
which is cigarette smoke can cause doubling of time for effective mucus clearance. So the next lung defenses, lung defenses, mucus and airway surface liquid. The airway between the larynx and the respiratory bronchiole is lined by ciliated columnar epithelium and covered by airway surface liquid. The mucus layer performs many functions. Like first function is it entraps the particulate matter and microorganisms. Second, it is a movable media propelled by cilia. Third, it is a waterproofing layer. It reduces fluid loss in the airway. Another function is the mucus layer. It acts as a medium in which it can transport enzymes, immunoglobulins, and antiproteases. Now, we will discuss about impaired airway clearance and the, what are the factors which affect it. First is ineffective mucociliary clearance. Second, excessive secretions. Third, thick secretions. Fourth is ineffective cough. Fifth, restrictive lung diseases. Sixth, immobility, inadequate exercises. And seventh is dysphagia or aspiration or gastroesophageal reflux. These all ca causes the impaired airway clearance. The results of impaired airway clearance we see usually in the uh, diseases in which this impaired airway clearance occurs. We see airway obstruction. We can as uh, seen in COPD patients, mucus plugging, it can be seen in uh, cystic fibrosis or in bronchial asthma, atelectasis, and another is impaired gas exchange. Because of this impaired gas exchange occurs, usually in COPD, then infection. What happens because of when there is impaired airway clearance, the, the infection, many pathogens, many bacteria, pseudomonas, hemophilus, influenzae, their infection uh, usually occurs in such conditions. And inflammation. Inflammation is a process which is going on whenever there is an impaired airway clearance. It increases usually in asthma patient when at the night time the, uh, the mucus clearance is decreased in uh, nighttime in asthma patients. It is more pronounced, the decrease of um, mucus clearance is more pronounced in asthma patients usually at night, which is mainly due to the increased inflammation which is undergoing there. So there is a you see, vicious cycle of impaired airway clearance. Whenever there is an impaired airway clearance, usually we see mucus plugging, obstruction of the airways, which can lead to further lung infection. This lung infection, uh, because of this lung infection, there is a increased inflammation process going on, which leads to increased mucus production. This lung inf inflammation and this all this causes lung damage. This lung damage, there is a because of this lung damage and damage to airway, there is a mucus retention, which further leads to impaired airway clearance. So this vicious cycle goes on and on, and what we see the muco occlusive uh, uh, respiratory diseases diseases like rest in uh, cystic fibrosis copd in such cases we see because of the impaired airway clearance uh, this phenomena continues to go on now we see the various uh, uh, respiratory conditions in which and how they Effect they cause impaired airway clearance in what manner they cause it. For example, we see uh, bronchial asthma. We all know that in bronchial asthma, mucus plugging obstruction in the airways is seen. So this leads to impaired airway clearance because of this. Then there is an aspiration whenever there is a case of aspiration, which can lead to infections, and this infection further leads uh, causes uh, impaired airway clearance. Other is cystic fibrosis. We have discussed earlier cystic fibrosis, the viscous, thick viscous secretion, which cause increase uh, impaired with airway clearance. The impaired airway clearance is there in cystic fibrosis. We have discussed it earlier. Other is the gastroesophageal reflux, 
which can cause lung damage and which further leads to impaired airway clearance then neuromuscular weakness in the neuromuscular weakness there is a expiratory uh, and there is a weak flow of out outflow of air is weak in such a respiratory polio patients and which can further lead to mucus retention in the respiratory system and this mucus retention will further lead to impaired airway clearance then we have dis discussed the primary ciliary disc kinesia earlier also uh, in primary ciliary disc disc kinesia which is a congenital condition which also causes mucus retention and this mucus retention further leads to impaired airway clearance so we have seen the um, basic pathophysiology of the impaired airway clearance and how it occurs in different uh, airway conditions and different respiratory conditions we have uh, studied it. and uh, later on during panel discussion we will discuss discuss it in more details about the uh, pathophysiology of impaired airway clearance and how to how to improve this in various uh, conditions various respiratory disease what are the intervention which we can uh, take to decrease this impaired airway clearance and uh, the mucus retention how to prevent it so we will discuss it uh, during panel discussion thank you Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, so, at the outset, I would like to thank CCI, Dr. Krishna, and Dr. Vijay for giving me this opportunity, and thank you, sir, for laying the foundation for the uh, the panel discussion. Uh, the uh, you have already talked about the pathophysiology for the various hypersecretory states. So, I'll be talking about the various intervention that can be done in such conditions. So, before going uh, for uh, such interventions, first you should uh, know what is your pathology you are dealing with, what is a pathophysiological rationale for using any kind of uh, strategy for in, uh, taking out the sputum, whether the patient is really facing any difficulty, are the retained secretions affecting the lung functions or not. So, if yes, then you should proceed and there are different therapeutic strategies that we can adopt so that these hypersecretory states can be managed, patient is able to expectorate well, because these hypersecretory states not only lead to airflow limitation, airflow obstruction, but is also the source of infection for the patient and exacerbations. So there are three basic techniques. The first one is the manual coughing. The manual coughing is, first one is a normal coughing that uh, the patient can have, with the, which is a protective reflex with the patient clears the mucus against the closed glottis with a high speed expiratory flow. Then there is another kind of cough, which is called the Hoff cough, which is also a kind of cough, uh, manual coughing uh, that the patient can do. But in that, the patient has a mouth open. It is also a forceful expiration, but the glottis is open. And the patient uh, contracts his chest and abdominal muscle during the maneuver. And sound is like a sigh. It is still a forceful, but it is a little bit controlled and it is not that forceful as the normal cough is. So these are the manual cough uh, things that the patient can do to take out the sputum. Apart from that, there are active test physiotherapy techniques like the breathing exercises, the diaphragmatic exercises, firstly breathing and costal expansion exercises. Then there is autogenic drainage which in which the patient controls his own breathing, the rate and depth, and he takes the breathing at different volumes during the respiration to achieve the highest possible expiratory flow which is an active but not forced expiration. So this also helps in the drainage of the uh, secretions. So this can be taught well by your chest physiotherapist. I will not go into the details. And uh, it helps in unsticking of the secretions, the collection of the secretions, and then the evacuations. These are the various stages of uh, this autogenic drainage. Then there is active cycle of breathing where the patient controls his own breathing. Uh, for a few seconds, like 20 to 30 seconds, he take tidal volume, then again deep breathing, then uh, again tidal volume, followed by half cough. This also helps uh, the techniques help in taking out the sputum. Uh, then there are manual techniques. Uh, the most commonly one are the postural drainage. The various positions are adopted to drain the secretions from the periphery of the lung to the uh, central, from where they can be taken out by the patient himself or uh, through the various, uh, um, like, can be suctioned out. 
So depending upon the pathology, if there is localized bronchitis, different positions can be adopted for the proper drainage of the secretions. Then chest percussions, which is done with the flat of the hand and uh, vibration that is done with the flat of the hand. Chest percussion, which is done with the help forming a cup with your hand. That is performed like you, um, you make a cup with your hand and do vibratory motions at the back of the chest from the downwards to the upwards so that the uh, secretions are loosened, out, uh, loosened and they come from the periphery to the center from where they can be taken out by the patient himself. So these are the techniques which the patient can learn from the physiotherapist and can do at home also. Then manual hyperinflation is generally done with the help of ambu bag. These techniques are generally not recommended now because uh, hyperinflation with the ambu bag can lead to barotrauma. We commonly see that this kind of uh, uh, the maneuver being done in ICUs for uh, taking out the secretions, for loosening the secretions, but this is not recommended. Uh, this should be avoided. Then there are me mechanical devices like the oscillatory positive expiratory pressure, like the OPEP devices. These are the devices which are now being very famous for the last few years. Uh, they have a very uh, beautiful, uh, like uh, you can say the principle, where the patients expire against, uh, like when the patient gives a forceful expiration, he expires out through a resistance. So when this resistance is encountered, oscillatory waves are produced, which are transmitted to the central or the peripheral airways which loosens out the, uh, the secretions and the patient is able to take them out easily. Apart from that, uh, like there, uh, the acapella device uh, you must have heard of, there is a resistant part which I just talked about that it produces successive disturbances which leads to vibration during expiration. But apart from that, it helps to produce a positive pressure. So during expiration, the it prevents the collapse of the alveolus. So during expiration also, the uh, the alveoli do not collapse and the secretions are able to transfer from the periphery to the center where they can be easily mobilized. So a capella device helps in vibration of the vibration and loosening of the, uh, the secretions as well as it prevents the alveolar collapse so that the uh, secretions can be taken out during the expiratory phase as well. Then the... Another beautiful device is aerobica, which also works on similar principle. There are different levels of resistance through which the patient can expire out according to its uh, his or her ease. And it produces vibrations and loosens out. And apart from that, this device is very handy. And you can use a nebulizer along with that. So these devices are very beautiful, very handy devices, which I have found quite useful, especially in my neuromuscular patients. And uh, there has been recent systematic review also, which have found them, they reduce the length of hospital stay and admission in COPD patients because they have been effective in clearing the secretions and improving the lung functions. And uh, this systematic review uh, recommended that they can be used in the post-exacerbation care. So uh, these devices, the newer devices are, uh, can be quite useful, especially in COPD patients, which uh, where they can help to uh, loosen out the secretions. Then there are mechanical insufflation exufflation devices. These devices deliver positive pressure followed by a rapid fall to the negative pressure. So they simulate the natural cough reflex where there are changes in the inspiratory and expiratory volume. And during expiratory flow, the movement of the secretions occurs from the periphery to the center. And there is loosening of the secretions and uh, the patient, uh, and then th that can be taken out by the patient or by the suction catheter. And the, uh, the beauty of these devices is that, that that can be used with both artificial as well as without artificial. This is a kind of device that is connected and it can be used with the ET tube. It can be used with an uh, oronasal mask or the catheter mount. So this device is very, very useful, especially in neuromuscular disorder patients where uh, it simulates the cuff and helps in the loosening of the secretions. Then there are high frequency chest wall compression. This is a kind of belt or vest which can be applied to the chest and produces external vibrations leading to uh, the like kind of a mechanical cough assist device and helps in in uh, uh, the decreases the stickiness and helps to remove it from the walls. So uh, this kind of device is very useful. The second, the third category that we were talking about apart from the chest physiotherapy and the various breathing exercises are the drugs which we commonly use. The one is expectorants. Expectorants mainly increase the water content of the airway secretions. The most commonly used expectorant uh, is the hypertonic saline, that is 3% or 7%. Uh, 
uh, it works on the principle of osmolality. Like when it when hypertonic saline in the nebulous form is given, it ex extracts water from the from the various cells surrounding it. So it increases the volume of the secretions, make it more liquidy, so that it can be easily taken out by the patients. So there are other uh, agents are also there like mannitol, but they are not very commonly used. Hypertonic solution three and seven percent are very easily available, and in the nebulous form, <coughs> they can be used. Then is guanfacin is there another agent which decreases the viscosity of the mucus and we have found this component in various cough syrups also but it has not been shown to be clinically effective in the various uh, RCTs that has been performed but it may be used in the uh, maybe a one of the components used in the expectorant in the various cough syrups. Then the second category is the muco regulators. These uh, agents interfere with the DNA F acting network, the basic uh, the uh, intermesh of the in the mucus. So these can be anticholinergic medication, the glucocorticoids, and I would specifically want to talk about these macrolides, which do help uh, in reducing the sputum production. They not only act as antibiotics but also anti-inflammatory. They decreases the amount of sputum production on the long term basis. That's why they have been recommended as long term antibiotics in patients of bronchitis or diffuse pan bronchitis, sinobronchial syndrome, or otitis media, where apart from being having an antibiotic effect, they help in reducing the copious amount of sputum that the patient is producing. So uh, the chances of infections are very less, chances of colonization are less. The third category is the mucolytic agents, which helps by degrading the mucus content of the airway secretions and thus decreasing the viscosity. The classical mucolytics that we use is the N-acetylcysteine that we are very commonly used in the tablet forms, IV forms, in the nebulous forms. It is uh, very, very found to be useful in COPD. The recent data has been there which has shown that it helps in the reduction of the exacerbations. Obviously, because of the things, it, it helps in taking up the sputum so that the number of infections are less, number of uh, which leads to the decrease in the number of exacerbations. So it has been found to be useful, especially in COPD but can be used in bronchitis patients, neuromuscular patients, or other patients where uh, this is indicated, cystic fibrosis patients. The other category of mucolytics is a peptide one, like the Donnie's alpha, but these are very costly and they are not easily available. Uh, so an acetylcysteine category is the one which is commonly used. The fourth category is the mucokinetics uh, drugs, which basically act on the ciliary movement, the intensity, the movement of the cilia, they increase the airflow so that the cough, uh, the secretions flow towards the mouth and they also decrease the adhesion between the mucus and the cilia. So uh, these can be uh, the usual bronchodilators that we use. The ambroxol also acts as a mucokinetic. It stimulates the mucus secretions, reduces the viscosity, but the clinical studies in favor of ambroxol are conflicting. Bronchodilators, yes, has been uh, mentioned in the Gold Guidelines 24 also. For COPD patients, they have been uh, very useful in the exacerbation and the post-exacerbation period to decrease the sputum production and enhance the mucocleus secretions. So when we come to the individual drugs, individual uh, the pathologies, the the most bothersome is the one with the bronchitis because there is this has a pathophysiology of producing lot of copious amount of secretions. So pulmonary rehabilitation in the form of chest. Uh, physiotherapy is the uh, is a one of the backbone of the treatment of bronchitis. The hypertonic saline and acetylcysteine uh, can be used with a good data in favor of that. Recombinant DNA has been found to be useful, but only in the bronchitis that is associated with cystic fibrosis. But data has been lacking in the non CF bronchitis. Macrolides, as I have told, they have antibiotics and an anti inflammatory agents. They help to reduce the amount of sputum production and help in the reduction of exacerbations, especially in bronchitis patients and in localized bronchitis, postural drainage is very, very useful. So these are the uh, strategies that one can follow in bronchitis patients for managing these hypersecretory states. In COPD, yes, airway mucus hypersecretion is a big problem. It all, not only leads to airway bronchi uh, obstruction, limitation, VQ mismatch, but also leads to the trapping of a lot of mucus, leading to infections, exacerbations. So it is one of the treatable trait. And in stable state, it may lead to lung function decline, impaired quality of life, risk of hospitalization and mortality as well. And during exacerbations, it 
<clears throat> the patient's complaints of difficult expectorating, airway inflammation, as well as the bacterial adhesiveness is increased, so leading to a lot of infections in the vicious circles. So in stable as well as exacerbation state, COPD is a state of mucus hypersecretion uh, and re we really need to deal with it for the better management of the patient. So in such patients, smoking cessation is the one of the cornerstone because smoking is leads not only to it's a kind of systemic inflammatory uh, trigger factor but also it leads to uh, ciliary uh, uh, dysmotility and ciliary dysfunctions so smoking cessation is must opaque devices as i had told that acapella and aerobica devices are useful in such patients and there has now been data in favor of these hypertonic saline and n-cystyl cysteine can be tried but with N-acetine, you should be careful because sometimes they may lead to paradoxical bronchospasm as well. So you, uh, there has been data in favor of this, but meanwhile, you should be very vigilant in using these uh, agents. And one of the very common side effects of N-acetyl cysteine is emesis when uh, vomiting, when, especially when it is used given in the IV or the oral forms. So then uh, LAMA, the bronchodilators, they help in reducing the sputum production the uh, the, uh, the recombinant human ADs, they lack benefit in COPD patients. They have been uh, studies which are not in favor of this component. Then there are newer components that are coming, like CFTR potentiator, like Isentic uh, Cafour, uh, which there are one or two small studies in favor of it, but data is still very, very lacking to really introduce it in our daily practice. There are new bronchoscopic interventions that can be used to manage this hypersecretive state. The first one is a liquid nitrogen nasal cryospray. This is a kind of uh, endobronchial uh, like catheter technique where there is uh, you can ablate the various goblet cells or the mucus producing uh, cells by like a cryo technique that, which we use for cryotherapy. The uh, temperature drop downs to minus 190 degrees Celsius and helps in regeneration of the the mucus epithelium after that so uh and then another thing another strategy is the rheoplasty that also works on the similar principle but it is a non-thermal technique so both these uh, there are very few data or there are few uh the studies safety efficacy studies has been done but the data is still lacking they are still naive in their uh process so they can't be recommended the next thing is the targeted nerve den denervation for of the parasympathetic nerves that may be the source of uh, uh, like smooth muscle contraction and leading to more sp uh, sputum production. So denervating these parasympathetic nerves could be one of the target areas and studies have shown the time to first severe exacerbations and number of moderate to severe exacerbations were less in at two years were less in, in the <coughs> therapeutic arm after two years. So this, as I told that these are still in their initial, uh, this, uh, the data is very, very uh, sparse and uh, we really need to have more work more evidence to uh, put them into practice mucolytis for acute exacerbation of copd yes the meta analysis does favor with moderate certainty that they increase the amount of treatment success by 37% and clinical improvement in the symptoms but there is very little data in favor to uh, of their role in reduction of the future exacerbations and improving the quality, health related quality of life. And they do not seem to have impact on breathlessness, length of hospital stay. But they uh, they do help in the treatment success and improvement in the symptoms. So uh, in practical purposes also, mucolytics do have a role. They help in uh, taking out the sputum. Patient feels the relief when the, once the sputum is taken out. So they may, uh, they can be used, they can be, uh, they have been recommended in the gold guidelines also. In mechanically ventilated patient, humidification is very, very important. The beds are there, which can help in the lateral rotation as well as kin kinetic uh, kinetic movement of the beds at regular intervals, which help in the postural drainage. Suctioning should be done as needed only. And as I told that manual hyperinflation with ambu bag is not recommended in mechanically ventilated patients. And even the use of saline installation for or soda bicarb is also not recommended for uh, this uh, airway clearing, especially in mechanical ventilated patients, because it may lead to barotrauma and the saline installation or the soda bicarb may lead to paradoxical bronchospasm also. And the use of such agents for acute respiratory failure in critically ill patients is also not usually recommended. The systemic review and meta-analysis do not support the routine use of mucoactive agents in the critically ill patients. 
so uh, these uh, agents do have a role but in few subset of respiratory patients uh, copd bronchitis but not in all the patients in neuromuscular disorder patients you need to really assess the swelling reflex you really need to assess the cough reflex with the cough uh, devices and uh, in such patient respiratory muscle training is very very important manual assisted coughing uh, chest percussions manual cough assist devices like the acapella or the aerobica can be used high frequency chest wall compression and oscillations can be done and as i told that mycolytics are not very well studied in this subgroup as well so in neuromuscular patients the chest physiotherapy uh, the assist devices are much more useful and n-acetylcysteine etc can be used but not uh, with much evidence so uh, as uh, we now we have discussed uh, that the airway mucus hypersecretion and mucus accumulation in the lungs are a very very important issues for the chronic airway disease patient they not only lead to increased symptoms in key exacerbation they also lead, may lead to decline in the lung functions on a long term basis so but uh, these problems have to be tackled on the case to case basis the patient preferences need to be taken the cost of the device should be taken into fish into account and one or more combinations of chest physiotherapy breathing exercises cough assist devices and the medicines the permutation combination can be used uh, for the management of such patients so we'll be discussing more about this during our panel discussion and we'll take up the questions uh, later so i'll hand over the mic to dr vijay now thank you Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Doctor uh, Sweta, for that wonderful, wonderful presentation. And um, uh, Doctor Kulbir as well. And uh, you made uh, my job very, very easy. And uh, now, in the next few minutes, uh, uh, I'll discuss about uh, uh, the today uh, device that is Aerobica. Okay, and um, the disclaimer is uh, the slides was provided by our uh, uh, Lupin people. Okay, and uh, there is no financial association. So coming to so various guidelines they recommends usage of uh, uh, pharmacological and non pharmacological interventions in patients with hypermucous secretory state, as discussed as you know uh, delivered. By the talk from uh, both Dr. Kulbir and Dr. Swetha, it is evident. And uh, the non pharmacological management options include airway clearance therapy, such as oscillating positive expiratory pressure, which aim to facilitate mucus transport and sputum expectoration. And this is one device uh, where uh, 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 devices drug free therapy to help patients keep their airways clear so it is something like uh, this will help the patients to bring out the sputum and um, the best analogy which i can recollect is whenever we are handling a foreign body airway foreign bodies so it is first important step is to help the dislodge the foreign body and then then to bring out the foreign body out of the airways. So that is the steps. Similarly, aerobica helps in both in dislodging the mucus and disimpacting the mucus. And also it helps in mobilization of the mucus, mucus to the proximal airways so that patient can um, cough the sputum out, mucus out. So when we look at this uh, device, the various parts include this is one way wall and uh, which uh, has low resistant wall which allows inhalation and exhalation without removing from the mouth and uh, the second one is nebulation port the beauty is no other device has um, uh, uh, which can facilitate the nebulizer usage via the positive expiratory pressure device so aerobic aerobica has got it has got standard 22 millimeter fitting accommodates small volume nebulizers for combined aerosol treatments. It has got exhalation ports, which helps in exhale breath is directed away from the patient, which is lightweight, ergonomic design, 
fits comfortably in the hand. Resistance in, is not position dependent, so patients can hold the device in the most natural position. And this design to ensure correct assembly and uh, every time and easy to clean it, disassemble it, and then also clean and disinfect the device. And uh, the resistance indicator is one thing which the patients, um, we have to teach them or our physiotherapist colleague or pulmonary rehab specialist will teach them about setting to adjust to the patient needs. There are five levels of resistance. So we, we can adjust as per the patient groups. So aerobica, uh, the clinical evidence so far shows it can facilitate in reducing the exacerbations, both in uh, COPD and bronchiectasis. It is going to improve the lung function or rather, rather improving the lung function. It also facilitated falling the, um, uh, or uh, preventing the fall of FE1, and which is a natural component in particular in COPD patients. There is a uh, increased fall in FE1 in this group of patients. The aerobica usage will help in prevention of such uh, aggressive fall in or aggressive drop in FE1s. And it helps in improvement in ventilation, thereby optimizing the VQ and uh, improve thereby, okay, it also helps in improving the overall quality of life. There is enough evidence uh, as per the published literature. If there is a significant reduction in proportion of patients requiring readmission. If we start using the patients on aerobica within 30 days of um, discharge. So there is a clear cut 28% reduction in exacerbations. Then patients, when compared with those who are not using on OPEP device, and those who were kept on aerobica. And uh, it is clear that uh, aerobica is going to uh, improve the lung function in bronchiectasis. It is going to improve the, um, uh, particularly in COPD patients, the improvement of SGRQ and improvement, improvement in CAT at least uh, by more than two points when uh, it is being uh, used for eight weeks in 62% of patients. That is pretty good number. And um, it is going to improve the ventilation in bronchiectasis by, um, uh, by dislodging and then facilitating expectation of the uh, impacted mucus. And uh, thereby, it is going to optimize the ventilation perfusion in bronchiectatic lung as well. It is going. Uh, going to usage of uh, reduce the usage of usage of corticosteroids and antibiotics. We know pretty much in both bronchiectatic patient and also COPD patients. Okay, recurrent exacerbations. After one once the patient lands in exacerbation, the patient the subsequent exacerbation is going to uh, be uh, the duration between previous exacerbation and the subsequent exacerbation is going to shorter. So. Our duty as a pulmonary physicians is to, if at all feasible, we have to prolong the next exacerbation. So, uh, and uh, the uh, lot of uh, steroid usage can lead to a lot of uh, um, side effects, particularly uh, diabetes or uh, osteoporosis and mood changes, so on and so forth. So. It also facilitates in reduction of usage of corticosteroids in COPD patients. Bronchiectatic health questionnaire score changed uh, from 58.7 to 66.6, .6, which shows a significant improvement over the treatment period on consistent usage of aerobicum in the given bronchiectatic patients. So, OPEP devices are not the same. So, OPEP uh, uh, variations in positive pressure oscillations may impact the therapeutic effectiveness. The significant clinical outcomes for COPD patients are based solely on the proprietary pressure oscillation dynamic of aerobica device and uh, it's very easy to handle. So, as per the Lupin statement says, aerobica okay, uh, is a effective one. Uh, there is no head-to-head -head comparison to my best of the knowledge. I have tried to review the literature, but 
uh, Lupin claims that um, not all OPEP devices are the same. And uh, my opinion is Aerobica is very good. I have used for the past close to around four to five years on more than hundreds of patients. So it works very effectively. And uh, I have used Acapella as well. And I have never used Flutter so far. So with this, uh, I would uh, like to uh, stop here. And then I advise technical team to play the video uh, of Aerobica. In healthy lungs, mucus is produced to trap and get rid of foreign particles or bacteria that get into the lungs. Mucus is cleared from the airways by tiny hairs on the walls of the lungs called cilia, which beat back and forth to move the mucus to upper airways, where it can be coughed out. Expelling mucus is a natural and necessary part of keeping ourselves healthy. But some lung diseases produce excess mucus that is thick and sticky impairing normal function and resulting in mucus buildup in the lungs. The cilia can also become damaged by reoccurring lung infections which cause inflammation and irreversible scarring. Over time, this causes excess mucus to build up, causing chronic lung infections, unproductive cough, shortness of breath, and lack of oxygen to the rest of the body. Unfortunately, this is one of the leading causes of death and one of the top reasons people are admitted to hospital today. Introducing the Aerobica Oscillating Pep Device, which helps keep the airways clear. With the Aerobica Oscillating Pep Device, pulses of resistance are created using exhaled breath. The resistance causes positive pressure to build up in the lungs, helping to hold the airways open. With the airways held open, the mucus is given more time and space to help it move out of the smaller airways. At the same time, the pulses, or oscillations, create vibrations within the airways, helping to thin and shake loose mucus which may be too thick or sticky for the pressure alone to move. The pulses also help free the cilia. The combination of oscillations, pressure, and freed cilia aids in moving the mucus into the central airways where it can be coughed out. Treatments will generally last between 10 and 20 minutes and they can be done up to four times each day. The more mucus can be moved from the small airways of the lungs to be coughed out, the better the lungs will be able to function, which is the overall goal of airway clearance therapy. Regular use of oscillating PEP therapy can help keep your lungs clear, which may improve oxygen exchange and help you feel better. For user instructions or to obtain more information about the Aerobica Oscillating PEP Therapy System, please visit www.aerobicaopep.com. That was a very, very informative video. Okay. And uh, once again, I sincerely thank Dr. Kulbir and then Dr. Sweta for their beautiful presentations. And uh, without wasting much time, I, um, I invite uh, now Dr. Ajay. Sir, can you please, you know, um, what is uh, actually the role of mucus in uh, normal pathophysiology? And also, does it have any uh, innate defense mechanisms, Dr. Ajay? Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. B Chopra and Dr. Uh, Bansal. Your lecture uh, was very informative. In fact, I learned a couple of things which I have not heard of. And uh, answering your question, uh, Dr. Vijay, see, mucus is highly oligomerized mucin polymer composed of water and various micromolecules glycoprotein as a part of gel structure. So we all know that it's a thin layer of liquid present over the bronchial epithelium as a continuous layer. And this layer consists of SOL and gel layers. What is this SOL layer? It's from Clara cells and there is some contribution from transudative fluid. What does it contain? It contains albumin, lysozymes, immunoglobulins, alpha-1 antitrypsin, alpha-1 anti-chymotrypsin, glycoproteins, and as well as lipids. What is the gel layer is there? It's from goblet cells and mucus gland. And it usually forms bulk of sputum in our bronchitis patient. 
what does it contain it contains 90% of water protein 1% carbohydrate 1% and lipids 1% and some part is dna and electrolyte as well the protein part is immunoglobulins particularly iga we all know that and also complex polydispersed glycoproteins so most important question comes that what is the uh, function of it so as dr chopra has initially mentioned that um, bronchial mucus gland forms the mucus which works as a waterproofing for diminishing water loss it also protect the epithelium for forming a barrier between epithelium and particles which are inhaled on every minute what is the defense mechanism in a defense mechanism it provides it provides by removing the inhaled particle as well as because of the result of ciliary activity and by acting as a vehicle for immunoglobulins so even when it is barrier is broken then only particulate matter or chemicals or obnoxious uh, material including gases all the you know an organism viruses bacteria they can enter only when there is a breach yeah thank you thank you dr ajay for that beautiful um, explanation so mucus if uh, probably it acts as a first line defense so we, uh, organisms have to breach mucus layer and uh, to reach the epithelium and subepithelial layer to cause any infection so that's how important the various uh, um, chemicals um various molecules that exist in the mucus helps in um maintaining our respiratory health uh thank you dr ajay uh dr mrigyank hi uh, hello so, sir um, can uh, this uh, mucociliary clearance can be measured and uh, what are the various clinical implications of the regional differences in mucociliary clearance in the upper and lower airways uh hello sir uh first of all i would like to uh, thank uh, chess council of india and dr nh krishna sir for this wonderful opportunity uh, to be part of this esteemed panel and thank you uh, uh, dr vijay sir for such wonderful moderation uh, so sir uh, yes uh, mucociliary clearance can be measured uh radio aerosols can be used to study the mucociliary transport uh, from the ciliary airways however uh, throughout the world only a very few centers do it and also a, even fewer centers do it uh, routinely so but it is possible so insoluble technetium 99 uh, label colloids are inhaled and deposited they are usually deposited in the proximal airways and uh when these are uh, inhaled and deposited their subsequent clearance is assessed by scintigraphy so uh, uh during the procedure if the person uh, doesn't cough then the radio aerosol clearance that we see is uh, equivalent to the mucociliary clearance however if the patient does cough during the procedure then we'll see that uh, the radio aerosol clearance that we can see it is a combination of the mucociliary clearance as well as the cough clearance uh the clinical implication that uh, we need that it is mainly done to find a possible link between the mucociliary clearance and the the pathophysiological uh, pathophysiology of the lung disease to see whether there is a connection between them uh so uh, suppose we have a patient uh, who presents with uh, recurrent respiratory infections uh, with or without bronchiectasis so uh, if we see that uh, there is a universal and very slow mucociliary clearance uh, throughout that is uniformly the mucociliary clearance is very low uh, then we can think that it can have a underlying ciliary dyskinesia that is primary ciliary dyskinesia uh but if we see that uh, the mucociliary clearance is only regionally abnormal so we can still from that we can conclude that it is a case of bronchiectasis it can be idiopathic bronchiectasis and uh for the other parts uh so the the clinical implications of the regional differences that uh, you had asked so the density of mucus producing goblet cells in the respiratory epithelium they decrease with branching of airways 
until almost near zero. So uh, for that, there's decreased risk of clogging uh, in the narrow airways with mucus. In the small airways, uh, the surfactants are mixed uh, into the airway surface liquid, that is the ASL, to reduce the surface tension. And uh, they also prevent the mucus bridging. But however, in the when there is an airway disease, the mucociliary clearance is negatively affected due to changes in the mucus composition and also production uh, because of decreased ciliary function, decreased number cilia. And uh, also there is altered airflow, airflow and particle deposition in the obstructive airways. So, uh, for example, if we see a case of asthma, uh, mucus overproduction is a huge, uh, the clinical implication that uh, we can see here is that uh, in a case of asthma, there will be uh, mucin hyper, hyper overproduction. Uh, so the mucus plugs can get deposited in the distal airways then uh, these plugs and can they can persist also for uh, a long time. Uh, so uh, and if there's smooth muscle contraction uh, surrounding the luminal plugs, there can be uh, further it constricts the airways. So uh, our main therapy in asthma should be to decrease the mucus overproduction and also uh, to uh, the reduce the plasma extravasation also. So along with the anti-inflammatory therapy that we give for uh, asthma, so uh, it is also important that we target the uh, uh, IL-13, IL IL-5, IG with uh, immunotherapies against them so that we can have a, a proper control on the mucus hyperproduction also. So uh, this, was, this is the... Thank you. Thank you. Mugyank. Mugyank has, you know, wonderfully said, so... Measuring the uh, mucociliary uh, clearance, okay, um, is possible. Of course, it is not done on routine basis in all hospitals, but it is possible. It also helps in uh, differentiating the uh, primary cilia dyskinesia versus the focal bronchiectasis. That is very very important point that I have learned, uh, Murugya. Thank you. And then mm -hmm. when I was uh, googling about uh, mucociliary uh, clearance okay i got to know very very fascinating information that in a human airway there are a uh, entire respiratory tract i mean the cilia from nose to alveolar level if you measure the amount of uh, cilia that are present they are three trillion in number amazing amazing yes. and uh, the way the fastness with which they beat mm -hmm. they function we don't know. Nature has created so much wonderful mechanisms to protect against uh, toxins and then bacteria and then viruses. The fastness with which they beat is, is uh, they said it is 14 Hz frequency, which is uh, when we label, it is twice as the speed of the fastest ceiling fan available in the world. So that's the fascinating news I want to convey here. So. Uh, uh, now, I call upon uh, Dr. Uh, Kulbi, sir. So, what role does this submucosal glands play in mucociliary clearance? And what is the role of uh, or importance of hydration in maintaining the mucociliary clearance? Sir, as we see, the mucus gland, uh, mucus is produced by submucosal gland, is a key component of the respiratory mucociliary transport. We, said that we see that mucus binds the particulate matter and carries it up to the uh, airways and propelled by the ciliated uh, cells, surface epithelial cells. So this mucus contains mucin. It also contains various antimicrobial functions. Uh, using muc mucins are usually heavily uh, glycosylated uh, uh, proteins linked end-to-end -end with disulfide bonds to form a long structure. So this submucosal gland produce, uh, sometimes they they can act in a, a, a different manner. Uh, in submucosal gland produce abnormal mucus, uh, which can uh, disrupt the mucociliary transport, as seen in the cystic fibrosis disease, which is an iron, iron transport disease in which there is a, a thick, vis viscous uh, uh, secretions are there because of high uh, 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 chloride and uh, uh, very 
uh, low water content in the mucus so we see that uh, this thick viscous uh, secretion get trapped in the air base and form mucus plugging and which leads to uh, impaired airway clearance whereas in copd and asthma we see that submucosal gland hypertrophy occurs and which produces excess mucus and this excess mucus uh, disrupt the uh, airway outflow so air thus causing impaired airway clearance in copd and asthma whereas uh, hello yeah I'm, please kulbirba so yes. that's a, uh, uh, that's beautifully summarized thank you and uh, may I call upon uh, dr sweta you want to add anything regarding the uh, mucociliary think... clearance yeah dr sweta you are muted ma so like just sir has said that uh, the mucin is one of the major component of the like uh, the mu the mucus that is the major co uh, the secretory component so uh, mucociliary clearance per se is the basic defense mechanism of the lung through which any inhaled uh, foreign particle in the form of bacteria toxin is uh, being taken out of the body so the this mucociliary clearance as has been discussed by dr kulbir and dr uh, uh, ajay also that Uh, the mucociliary defense mechanism basically the we have zero stratified uh, epithelium which has cilia and above the cilia we have pre ciliary layer and then we have the mucus so it is a movement of this uh, cilia in the mucus layer which helps to propel the uh, the foreign bodies the bacteria from below to the uh, central as well as to the uh, upper airways so where from where it can be coughed out so this this is a mucociliary clearance which uh, is a basic Uh, a defense mechanism of the body which helps to take out the secretions and when this is hampered that leads to the various pathophysiologies that we are talking on copd bronchitis or the cystic fibrosis patients thank you dr sweta thank you um anything dr ajay you want to add so far we are See. going good so um uh, uh yeah. for dr ajay um i want to bring an interesting point here so we know there are various diseases particularly asthma copd cystic fibrosis as dr kulbir was mentioning so is there any uh, um, in all these diseases hypersecretion is a common phenomenon but is there any specific disease specific specific characteristics that we can differentiate or phenotype so that how we can treat these diseases individually yeah uh, yeah it's a very good question in fact uh, particularly uh, in a era where whenever we are uh, you know called up to give opinion in various patients and uh, as i am very sure that most of us see prescription of uh, various doctors so they we you see a lot of permutation and combination you know you see it's like many times the same kind of combination is given to the patient with asthma and bronchitis and copd yes. so some drug is uh, you know stopped if there is some side effect see anti leukotrienes and bronchodilator and nebulization yes. and here it is very important that we should go little bit in depth to understand the pathophysiology of it so as i uh, was you know reading for this there are two very important characteristic physical properties are there of the bronchial mucus mucosa mucus which which are they they are their viscosity and their elasticity you know you see viscosity uh, if we all remember the physics part viscosity is a measure of fluid resistance to flow where there whereas the elasticity is a measure of solids ability to store the applied energy in order to return to its normal shape so what happens is in particularly see we all know that in asthma there is severe air limitation there is bronchial hyper responsiveness there is smooth muscle contraction and right from the early stage there is a lot of mucus uh, hyper secretion and which blocks the multiple bronchioles leading to difficulty in breathing now we all know that if you see the naked examination of such bronchi you will be able to see that there are blocked with thick tenacious sputum and even if you ask uh, some of the asthmatic 
and uh, they will be able to tell that the sputum which they bring out they will be able to bring out that it has a very elastic nature sometimes they are able to even show that they they can they find it difficult to remove and sometimes it is removed and it has elastic nature so we all know that there is an marked hypertrophy and hyperplasia of submucous gland and there is goblet cell hyperplasia which leads to lot of eosinophilic granulation and disengagement of eosinophilic ketonic protein and major basic proteins so mucus plug also contains particularly when i'm talking about asthma so i'll go one disease by one there there are lot of charcoal laden crystals and cushman spirals and various cytokines so we all know that in patients with uh, mild to severe asthma there are this cytokines there's various cytokines interleukins 4 interleukin 5 gncsa there is increased uh, uh, content of uh, th2 cytokines and there are lot of cells which are also retrieved by bal examination when we come to copd in copd there is air flow limitation there is excess sputum production and mainly during exacerbation and as well as during normal copd in, in even at uh, when the patient is not having any secondary exacerbation or or um, uh, second or exacerbation there in both cases you will see that there is a lot of neutrophils and this mucus the, because there is excess mucus production they find that this it is because of lot of irritant and including not only just irritant from the smoke but as well as the irritant which is from like sulf nitrogen uh, you know sulfur dioxide nitrogen dioxide various um, toxins various irritants in because of occupational exposure and air pollution so all this leads to so much of mucus production that in copd there is uh, the they find it very difficult particularly if you have associated area of damage in the beyond respiratory bronchial we call it emphysema so in emphysema if the, it is we don't we don't get isolated emphysema cases and isolated copd cases but we all know that there could be a heterogeneity in the in the patient and in those patient we will find it that you have to take use of all the measure to take this out cystic fibrosis as dr chopra was mentioning there also the there is less mucus and more of uh, chloride dysfunction you know that iron transport so there also i mean we don't see lot of cystic fibrosis patient but there also there is mucus blockage is there and that is why there is a difference and how do you treat in copd i will always like to increase the pulmonary pulmon put the patient in pulmonary rehabilitation to increase the muscle strength so that the mucus is easily excreted out and easily taken out from the lung because the more mucus remains in the in the airway the overnight production of myeloperoxidase you know we also call it as virido peroxidase that give rise to mucopurulent or greenish color to the sputum so in all condition in bronchiectasis lot of sputum is greenish yellowish is because of excess production of certain enzymes so if we know the pathophysiology then treatment becomes better so we can optimize the treatment yeah wonderful uh, summary uh, dr ajay so uh, if if i may add up or you know try to make it more brief um, asthma copd and cystic fibrosis if you see they are three separate distinct entities we cannot as dr ajay was clearly mentioning we cannot the same kind of treatment doesn't work for everything so if you look at the mucus so there are the uh, um, uh, the mucus contains naturally the mucin plasma proteins lot of inflammatory cells dna and uh, uh, some bacteria if you particularly see asthma there will be no bacteria and then lot of uh, plasma proteins and then mucin will be there and then if you see the copd component again mucin component will be there and then uh, there will be some amount of more amount of dna and also bacteria this bacterial component is almost non existent in asthma whereas when we look at a cystic fibrosis component everything is too much that means there will be too much mucin there will be too much plasma proteins lot of uh, de denatured uh, cells leads to presence of dna plenty of bacteria so 
understand the pathophysiology and then treat the disease. Asthma, bronchodilators, as uh, Dr. Ajay was mentioning, COPD along with bronchodilators, it is very, very important to consider um, uh, in COPD along with the bronchodilators, you need to have mucolytic agents and then if needed, you may need to add, a, since the bacteria is there, you may need to add the antibiotics as well. And uh, in, in cystic fibrosis, everything is to a larger extent it is present. So that's why along with pulmonary rehabilitation and uh, you need to have a mucolytic agent, good antibiotic, good steroids, everything together. And uh, the uh, presence of DNA is also more thus okay the darkness alpha action comes into existence in cystic fibrosis and it doesn't come in the picture of non-cystic fibrosis related bronchiectasis so uh, with this uh, summary and then uh, i would now call upon a uh, murgyank okay can you please uh, uh, dr kulbir has uh, wonderfully summarized in uh, one of his slides about the vicious circle hypothesis and uh, defective airway clearance. Can you please elaborate, Murgyank? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, this vicious circle hypothesis uh, is one of the most important things in the pathophysiology of bronchiectasis. So uh, what happens is uh, with the initial uh, infective insult to the airways, the microorganisms trigger a release of toxins and inflammatory response in the airways. Uh, there is release of neutrophils, macrophages, uh, lymphocytes uh, within the bronchial lumen. Uh, then uh, the it affects the uh, the neutrophils alter the function of the ciliary epithelium. The ciliary beat frequency is altered, and there is mucus gland hypersecretion also, uh, which in turn compromises the mucociliary clearance. Uh, with the loss of the mucociliary clearance the airway becomes susceptible to microbial colonization. Now, uh, neutrophils also allow bacterial adherence to the airway epithelium. Uh, with bacterial colonization, there will be intense chronic inflammatory response will be triggered. And uh, with further release of inflammatory mediators like cytokines, elastin, elastases, there will be neutrophil migration to the bronchial lumen and the bronchial mucosa. So, uh, in turn, there will be tissue damage, there will be destruction of the bronchial elastins. And so, in turn, in for a case of bronchiectasis, which is predominant, that is the permanent dilatation of the bronchi will be there. Uh, the normal mucosa, it will be substituted by uh, the airway walls becoming thickened with edema, ulceration, and fibrosis. Uh, if in the proximal airways, uh, there will be the decrease in the structural cartilages, supporting structures will be compromised, which will again lead to pooling of the mucus. So, so all of this will lead to a cycle of infection and inflammatory uh, inflammation, promoting progressive airway damage and recurrent infection also. Right. And in turn, the impaired mucociliary clearance will be there and excess sputum production also there. So it will be like a vicious cycle of uh, inflammation, then uh, excess mucus production. So that will be the vicious cycle. Sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Murgyan, for a beautiful, beautiful explanation. There are plenty of questions that are coming from the uh, various uh, uh, um, pulmonologists across the India. Okay, we will come to those questions a little later. Thank you, Dr. Milan Kanti uh, from West Bengal and De uh, Dr. Kalam Singh uh, from Butola, Uttarakhand. We'll come back to your questions a little while uh, uh, later. Wait for probably 10 15 minutes. So, to sum up uh, what uh, Dr. Mugyank has mentioned, so it appears that, that it is not in, in fact vicious cycle only, it is a vicious spiral, the infection culminating to inflammation. Inflammating leading to impaired ciliary defense mechanisms, thereby causing airway mucus obstruction, leading to microbial colonization, and call, uh, followed by airway destruction, leading to permanent changes. Once the permanent changes have happens, then the pathophysiology cannot be reversed, and then it's only the airway clearance techniques 
that is going to act from there onwards. Now, Kulbi sir, so in your uh, 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 one of your slides, you mentioned about uh, various effects of uh, chronic mucus hypersecretion on lung function. Can you please elaborate on this? Uh, yes, sir. Chronic mucus mm -hmm. hypersecretion is the main factor contributed to so the... Our increase. question is, sir, uh, whether this can uh, affect the morbidity and mortality as well and how it is going to affect. Chronic mucus hypersecretion is the uh, main factor contributing to uh, increase uh, uh, risk of morbidity and mortality in the COPD patient. Usually, this causes reduced lung function. In COPD, exposure to cigarette sm smoke or pathogen induces uh, the goblet cell hyperplasia and they decrease the number of ciliated cells in the lining and ultimately uh, there is an increased mucus production this, which causes which reduces the air flow caused by the mucus clogged airways which contribute to the pathogenesis of the COPD 50% of the COPD cases have this uh, chronic mucus hypersecretion so when compared to non-smokers and uh, smokers, we see there is an increased 3.5 times increased risk of death in the COPD patients with the chronic mucus hypersecretion. That is the <clears throat> side effect of this uh, tobacco smoke, which causes uh, this chronic mucus hypersecretion. Otherwise, uh, when we see uh, this reduced Air, uh, airway uh, impaired clearance can further lead to the uh, various infections like pseudomonas, hemophilus, influenza, which further increases the mucus production, leading to further airway uh, obstruction and uh, impaired clearance. So this vicious cycle goes on in 20 to 50 percent pati uh, patients of COPD. They have this uh, infections. Uh, usually, mostly in India, pseudomonas, pneumophilus, influenza cases. So, this infection further leads to increased mucus production, which leads further to the airway obstruction, and so the vicious cycle goes the on. Vicious spiral goes on, goes on, and goes on. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, here, I just want to add, sir, add uh, some important evidence behind uh, our statements. So, the COPD JAM gene study, which was published, uh, I think, two, three years ago in JAMA. So, where uh, the mucus plugs that occluded uh, medium to large size airways, when we do the CAT scans of this uh, COPD patients, and if they have, uh, okay, uh, the mucus plugs occluding the medium to large size airways, it is clearly shown that in these patients, the mortality is very much high when compared to same similar patients who are having similar FE1, but okay, without mucus plugging, so definitely the mortality is going to be pretty high in this patient. That's why to keep the airways very clean is very, very important. And it is very important to understand that the mucus hypersecretion management and in COPD patients is definitely is going to make the lung function better, quality of life better, acute exacerbations are decreased, and once acute exacerbations are decreased, definitely the hospitalization rates and financial burden on the families and the patients will be decreased, and ultimately culminating in the decreasing or reducing in the mortality of these patients. So that's why the managing mucus hypersecretion is very very important and uh, let me come to uh, dr mrugyank mrugyank so uh, please uh, um, state uh, what is the prognosis of these patients uh, with uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia and what is the significance of mucus dysfunction in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis do you think the mucus uh, clearance will play a major role in ILD cases as well. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, mucus clearance, as in sir. Uh, in uh, in cases of ILD, uh, there is the normal parenchymal tissue uh, is replaced by extensive fibrosis and epithelial dysplasia. 
there is extensive tissue remodeling also and there is loss of alveolar gas exchange regions. Uh, nowadays, uh, immunofluorescence staining of, uh, if we see in ILD cases, if immunofluorescence staining is done of the tissues, it has been seen that there is extensive goblet cell metaplasia and expression of MUC 5B uh, P63 also. So also there is loss of 82 cells. And uh, another very important thing uh, in ILD is that uh, they lose the epithelial cell cell type lineage restrictions. So there can be co-expression of 81, 82 and also conductive airway markers. So there will uh, so there will be increased expression of inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, and growth factors, uh, which are uh, predicted to recruit and activate the inflammatory cells in further leading to inflammatory responses and uh, impairing the mucociliary response. And uh, for the other parts, sir, uh, in primary ciliary dyskinesia, yes. primary ciliary dyskinesia, which is, which is an autosomal recessive disease. Even though uh, we see that it is not uh, uh, very life-threatening, the mortality, uh, it can be around uh, with a average age of 40, the mortality can be up to uh, 4 to 5 percent. But as it starts as early in childhood, uh, after just 24 hours of birth, it can start. So uh, living with primary ciliary dyskinesia is a very tough thing. So... Uh, the patient uh, after birth, the patient can uh, go for mechanical ventilatory support, can need long term oxygen therapy. Uh, uh, throughout the even after the, the patient progresses after that, but uh, throughout the year, the patient will have will be having a wet cough. There will be yeah. upper respiratory symptoms like rhinosinusitis. Uh, middle ear can be involved with uh, chronic uh, COSOMs. Yeah then there can be conductive and sensory neural hearing losses. Uh, we can suffer from subfertility uh, and other cases, uh, prenatal hydrocephalus can also be there. So, uh, and of course, there will be uh, frequent respiratory infections always and with uh, bronchiectasis also. So, uh, living a life with uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia will be very tough. Uh, the, it will be always be a challenge. And as we know, the treatment is only supportive with uh, reducing the mucus hyperproduction, uh, yeah. antibiotics and macrolide treatment. And uh, with all these only, we can uh, treat, uh, and the support, support, give a supportive treatment to the patient. Thank you, Murugyan. Thank, thank you so much. So what Murugyan wants to communicate is, you know, both in pre, uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia and then ILDs, mucociliary clearance plays a very, very crucial role and uh, in uh, managing these patients. And uh, we have to um, design the specific strategies to enhance the mucociliary clearance. Okay. And great news from uh, Krishnana. One minute, Ajay Bhai. Okay, I just want to read out what uh, yes. uh, our founder chairman has uh, mentioned. So, from the technical team, we have an information that 18... Yeah. 90 that means 1890 logins for uh, are they are uh, watching live okay and uh, wonderful um, uh, congratulations krishna is congratulating both at, uh, us and also team lupin and um, uh, thank you krishna for all, uh, for your uh, now guidance always and uh, may call upon uh, now uh, Kulbi, sir, for uh, can effective physiotherapy, sir. So, we uh, most of the times what we do is uh, so, apart from mucolytics, physiotherapy seems to work very well in en enhancing the mucociliary clearance. What are your comments? Ajay Bhai, you want to add anything for uh, Murugyank? Yeah, actually, uh, it was uh, I wanted to say that. Most of the time, early in the disease and even after many years, our ILD patients usually have dry cough. It right. is only when the patient becomes secondarily infected or infected with some, uh, you know, bacterial or viral infection, then mucociliary clearance is affected. So uh, what I was wondering was people who are listening should not get carried away that the sputum hypersecretion 
is there in asthma in copd in as well as in bronchiectasis and as well as in cystic fibrosis but uh, not in ild at least in the initial many years it's usually the uh, the diagnosis is made by uh, the exertional breathlessness and dry hacking cough with or without uh, i mean with very minimal sputum or without any sputum going on for months together that's how we uh, pick up you know this case is on chest x ray and uh, hrct scans i i completely i completely yes. agree with you ajay bhai initially they presents to generally there is a delay in diagnosis in uh, ild they come to us with you know at least couple of months of you know progressive worsening breathlessness along with the dry hacking cough so uh, this is very very important and mucolytics or uh, other uh, uh, things which can enhance the mu mucociliary function doesn't seems to work in earlier part of ild so that's a wonderful point ajay bhai yes. so now uh, i request uh, uh, dr sweta uh, to comment on what are the various you have uh, mentioned very clearly in your presentation madam regarding airway clearance techniques and uh, otherwise we call it as a bronchial hygiene therapy can you please for our um, audience sake one more time can you please brief it and sum it up so uh, basically the airway clearance techniques uh, if we talk about the bronchial hygiene techniques they may be divided into two kinds the proximal uh, acts or the peripheral ones the proximal acts uh, basically aim at uh, assisted inspiration expiration or both they mainly aim at cough aug augmentation this i have not discussed in my presentation i just want to add on so these are the proximal uh, airway clearance techniques which aim to augment the cough these like i have talked about the various breathing exercises uh, i have talked about the me uh, mechanical insufflation exhalation the airway stacking is one of another technique which uh, is also being done for assisted inspiration the manual assisted cough in the form of vibration percussion or the various postural uh, the drainage is also one of the part of the proximal one and uh, the combination uh, permutation combination of these and then there are peripheral acts which mainly aim at sputum mobilization from the distal airways to the central ones these mainly uh, do include the manual techniques which i discussed like the vibration percussion postural but apart from that the peripheral acts mainly like the high frequency chest wall oscillation techniques the best i was talking about the chest wall strapping the uh, the high frequency chest wall compressions the intrapulmonary percussive percuss uh, the ventilation as well as the various devices the acapella devices or the aerobica devices which help in uh, mobilizing uh, the sputum from the peripheries to the central airways so basically there are proximal as well as the uh, uh, the peripheral acts the airway clearance techniques that we uh, commonly talk of thank you thank you dr sweta now i request uh, dr ajay to comment on so we have discussed so much of about pathophysiology and then its impact in uh, um uh, in our uh, patients so now let's go for pharmacotherapy so ajay bhai so can you please broadly convey the message how to manage mucor hyper mucus hyper secretory diseases okay um uh, in clinical practice and day to day we have discussed definitely about pathophysiology and how what are the clinical take home points how you are going to manage in your clinical practice yeah in fact uh, dr shweta has uh, in the later part of her presentation she has uh, very beautifully mentioned about uh, you know mucoactive drugs True. so like i will cover the uh, another portion where it is called, you know we have pharmacological agent which increases the mucus clearance and these are called as mucoactive agents and okay. now there are uh, i mean dr shweta i think it will be a repetition the main purpose of this mucoactive drugs is to increase the ability to expectorate the sputum in the uh, best possible way and without uh, too much of exhausted uh, you know burden respiratory burden on the patient so there are four types one is uh, expectorant other are mucoregulators and third is mucolytics and fourth are mucokinetics so i i just label you know i'll just mention the names because dr shweta has already covered in her uh, presentation ha for expectorant we have hypotonic saline 
three percent and seven percent, which is very uh, routinely available. And uh, particularly, we also use in inducing um, sputum in patients which are um, suffering from pneumocystis carina in HIV patients, and as well as in a smear negative tuberculosis where the patient is not able to bring out any. I know it is slightly away from the topic, but patient who are coming with usually dry cough and then we want to you know avoid bronchoscopy even hypertonic saline is uh, found to be effective to bring out sputum and they may show acid fast bacillus so so expectorants are very important we have shweta madam has already covered about gofenesin containing uh, uh, you know lots of prepared lots and lots of cup syrups are available we have ionic ion channel modifier and uh, i really don't know because while preparing for this uh, presentation there is p2y2 pyrogenic agonist so if somebody knows it so i will be very happy to know muco regulators are carbocystins as and uh, anticholinergics and particularly anticholinergics now we have in the form of uh, you know uh, inhaled drugs ipratropium tiatropium uh, you know so many and so we have glucocorticoids and as well as uh, macrolides have found to be a good muco regulator and that is the reason in patients which are having chronic bronchitis and particularly bronchitis patient there is a definite role for a decade now that we give 250 mg of mac, uh, azithro azithromycin for many many months because it has a muco regulatory uh, you know effect mucolytics we all know that uh, the most commonest which is used is an acetyl cysteine there are peptides which are available and there are few more mucolytics which have uh, been not uh, advised and recommended in uh, some of the societies and mucokinetics are we all know that bronchodilator very very routinely used in uh, day to day practice and as well as in icu setups so there are bronchodilators there are um, you know amroxols there are tricyclic nucleotides and as well as surfactants so so these all are forms of mucokinetic uh, action so uh, essentially okay if i want to uh, if i can summarize what dr ajay uh, has mentioned very clearly expectorants mucoregulators mucolytics and mucokinetics so if you want to make the patient to bring out the sputum okay and uh, you please uh, you need to add expectorant so particularly 3% nsel or 7% nsel or gofenesin may play a major role muco uh, regulators here what is important is the amount of uh, mucus that is being secreted is in larger quantity so definitely the glucocorticoids and antibiotics like azithromycin or clarithromycin and anticholinergic agents is going to decrease the amount of uh, sputum secretion and it will help in um uh, managing the mucus hypersecretion and mucolytics and i just want to add what whatever dr ajay has mentioned uh, along with nac there is also one molecule called adostin so which can, which is uh, evolving in this era of mucolytics where it is claimed that it can enhance the mucolytic action of nac by more than many more fold so only time has to tell in india it is so far not available coming to muco uh, muco kinetics definitely a constricted airway well uh, i just want to say if you want to bring out something uh, the occluded thing from a constricted airway it is very very difficult for which you need to add bronchodilator so that the occluded mucus plugs can be easily expectorated and uh, uh, next uh, i requested dr sweta to uh pitching uh, for uh, defining a cough and uh, explain how important that the cough is going to play a dynamic role in airway clearance techniques because ultimately once you disinfect and then mobilize the secretions if the patient doesn't have any cough even in our earlier discussion dr krishna now was clearly mentioning what if the patient is paralyzed and is unable to do the cough so please explain the dynamic role of cough in acts airway clearance techniques so basically cough uh, is a forced expiratory maneuver it is a forced expiration when a patient does but against a closed glottis so and uh, intrapulmonary pressure is generated against which uh, the, there is dislodgement of the cough and it is a 
like the innate protective reflex, uh, reflex which is there in the body to expel, expel for the expulsion of this protein. So this is against the closed glottis. Obviously, this is very very important part of our airway chest clearance because if we are not able to take it, there is no point. It, uh, the, the sputum will remain inside. It will be a source of infection. It will lead to uh, the collapse of uh, the segmental or the lumbar collapse or the uh, the whole lung collapse. So basically, cough taking out uh, the sputum is very very important, and cough plays a very very important role. And in if even in in uh, neuromuscular disorder patient whose uh, cough reflex is very very poor, in those patients, uh, if the cough is not getting uh, cleared, but uh, you may if you are doing the postural uh, therapy or doing the chest physiotherapy, but the patient is not able to take out, and even after the oral suction, the there is lot of secretion which is pulling out. Then I think the tracheostomy is the only thing which is left in such patients. Otherwise, uh, uh, you may do various proximal or the peripheral uh, incisions, the airway clearance, but unless and until the sputum is being taken out by right. one or the other means, we, uh, there is no other means. If yes. There comes, there, there, there comes, uh, Dr. Jairaman has uh, nicely commented. Um, uh, it's a wonderful webinar. So, uh, Dr. Jai, Jairaman is uh, asking. Any role of bronchoscopy and lavage yes. in the system? How case of often will you do that? The question oh, is that. I agree, I agree. So, uh, broncos bronchoscopy for probably in. Uh, if the patient uh, is in, in hospital. Yeah. Maybe ventilated, uh, uh, ventilated patient. patient These kind of patients probably we can quickly proceed with bronchoscopy and finish the procedure and come back. But definitely it is going to be a temporary measure. And uh, Dr. Ajay, your comments. Yeah, in fact, uh, I had a couple of cases in last uh, decade or so where uh, bronchoscopy has helped to remove the mucus plug and uh, save the patient. Because particularly when the patient is very much extremely moribund and uh, there are some cases where the mucus plug literally makes the one hemithorax opaque. Yeah. And uh, and and their increasing peep and increasing a fire to is does more harm to the other lung than the good. In those in those cases, even in the middle of night, it is. I mean, uh, answering Dr. Jairaman's uh, question, even in the middle of night, if we have to pitch in and do an emergency bronchoscopy through endotracheal tube or tracheostomy tube and take away that uh, mucus plug, is is has many times saved the life. Because, you know, it may be blocking in the one segment and causing lobar collapse. But uh, if the mucus plug is large enough and, and it may collapse one whole lung. So just to give, if I have one minute to say, um, a decade back, I had managed a similar case of uh, where the lot of trauma at the airway, which has led to small collection of blood and the mucus and the fibrin and the incipitate and the serosanguous fluid, has literally formed a kind of you know softer structure, which was on one day it was giving left line collapse. We tried to do bronchoscopy. We just saw that there is a very big mucus plug, and the other day the ICU people called that they you know you did bronchoscopy wonderful. We were happy, but now the right lung is not blocked, but the left lung is collapsed. Now what do you do? So I remember taking out this kind of mucus plug is very very extremely difficult. Because through the narrow endotracheal tube and with very little gadgets, we can't take it out. And I remember last year, there is an article published uh, from uh, Institute Tata Institute, Tata Hospital, where they have used uh, in acute respiratory failure because of blood or mucus plug, the cryo probe they have used to take away that big, large mucus chunk immediately and uh, improving the survival. Um, if somebody wants to know, I can share the article. No, Dr. Ajay, we are using very uh, commonly. Cryo is extremely helpful in uh, handling uh, uh, such cases. And uh, uh, I can say probably uh, usage of cryo in such scenario, at least uh, one or two cases every month we are handling uh, at Apollo uh, Hyderabad. So uh, Jairaman has uh, nice comments. Uh, Dr. Vijay, Adostin is available in India, okay, and it is extremely helpful in obstructive bronchitis. Okay, thank you, Jay, for uh, uh, that insight. Now, um, I take 
opinion of Dr. Kulbi, sir. So what are the contraindications of chest physiotherapy, sir? So in the sense, uh, we are uh, we're talking too much about, you know, how to mobilize various devices and all those things. Sometimes um, uh, doing chest physiotherapy is absolutely contraindicated. Can you please enlighten us? Yeah. Uh, contradictions of chest physiotherapy are uh, first increased intracranial pressure. We should avoid it. Unstable head or neck injury. Uh, active hemorrhage or hemoptysis going on. We should avoid it. Recent spinal injury. Recent uh, refracture, flail chest, uncontrolled hypertension, uh, anticoagulation going on, and uh, medicines going for that. So we should, uh, these are the contra contraindications for the chest physiotherapy. We should avoid. Thank you, sir. Dr. Ajay, you want to add anything? Yeah, I think uh, particularly patients who are highly febrile and highly toxic, Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes even chest physiotherapy can induce bronchospasm. Yeah. I don't know how far it is true, but I haven't seen many cases. But chest physiotherapy, particularly vibration, they can induce bronchospasm if there is no bronchospasm. So we have to be very careful about people who have undiagnosed AV fistula or undiagnosed uh, or recently diagnosed aortic aneurysm. For any reason, uh, you know, we should avoid uh, chest physiotherapy. So earlier you were mentioning, Ajay, uh, there is, when there is an element of pulmonary embolism, you should not do chest physiotherapy. You were mentioning in our, uh, uh, just before uh, the, when the webinar war, uh, was yeah, uh, yeah. starting. What is your take on it? No, actually I misinterpreted. I have, uh, I remember, I actually misspelled Lind. Uh, I have a case uh, where we had a patient with recently diagnosed aneurysm. And he had a thrombus. Okay. And these are the patients where some vigorous physiotherapy has led to death immediately next day. Right. So, uh, coming to uh, Murugyank. Murugyank, so uh, can you please comment? Okay, when a patient who is having uh, bronchiectasis and is only having very streaks of hemoptysis, do you still proceed with very streaky hemoptysis, mild a streak of hemoptysis. Do you still proceed with uh, active toileting and then, you know, facilitating chest physiotherapy, postural drainage and everything? Or you will give antibiotic and steroid and nebulations to rest the lung? What is your take on it? Uh, sir, I feel uh, it is always better to rest the lung uh, for the, uh, because uh, if there is hemoptysis, if it increases, uh, because of the uh, hemoptysis, there can be uh, airway blockage also. So uh, it can further lead to deterioration in the patient. And uh, if it is not, uh, it's not very important. So we can still uh, hold the uh, physiotherapy for some time, for a few days, and let the lung rest for some time. We can give antibiotics and uh, tranexamic acid. And after the patient gets better, then we can further again we can proceed with physiotherapy so, uh, you suggest probably if it is very streaky hemoptysis mm -hmm. as well better to you know give rest to the lung mm -hmm. give antibiotic optimize it and then give probably tranexamic acid mm -hmm. and then stabilize the patient and then proceed mm -hmm. okay thank you for yes. that input um, dr milan kanti bag from west bengal okay uh, dr milan from west bengal howra he is uh, asking about uh, Dr. Sweta, can you please comment on role of NAC uh, for effective mucus clearance? Yes, obviously I have talked in my presentation also that N-acetylcysteine is very, very effective. And it, uh, it helps in uh, not only it is a it is an anti-inflammatory and antioxidant also. So it helps in the clearance of the mucus. A lot of studies are there in uh, COPD patients also where it has found to help in the reduction of the exacerbations by this, uh, dealing with this hypermicrosecretory pain. So NAC is a very, very useful. And also we have seen patients coming out, uh, coming in, uh, giving the feedback testers, they have got this. So N-acetylcysteine is the one which uh, has been documented, but not in other subject of patients like the neuromuscular eye, or they have been found to be useful in COPD. Thank you, Dr. Sweta, for that uh, uh, input. 
so uh, now it's uh, uh, 9:45 it's time to round up wrap up and uh, may ask each one of you uh, dr kulbi sir for your conclusion remarks yeah my con- my take home message will be that uh, we should involve physiotherapist in the management of amico occlusive airway diseases there is a great role for them for chest physiotherapy uh, chest physiotherapy should be encouraged along we uh, we usually treat such cases with uh, antibiotics mucolytics nebulization but we forget that uh, there is a, a role of chest physiotherapist in such cases so we should involve them and we should uh, take active participation from them this will lead to a better uh, resolution of the symptoms of such patient that i think right uh, dr mrigyank uh, yes sir uh, uh, i feel that uh, for uh, from my side the take home mes- message will be uh, it is always uh, along with the pharmacotherapy part it is always important to make the patient understand the counsel the patient regarding how to deal with his illness uh, what are the things uh, that they should along with the pharmacotherapy uh, what all non pharmacological uh, pharmacological measures also they should be taking what all preventions they should be taking so that they can uh, prevent their exacerbations of the illness and uh, lead a better quality of life along with it right ajay bhai uh most important thing uh, be- before managing also is to assess the severity so i feel that not only the patient but patient's close family member and as well as the uh, hospital where the patient get admitted or visits to a outpatient clinic he should be able to show that uh, you know he should be able to have his own sputum mug where if the sputum quantity is increasing or the characteristic is changing what is the significance should be explained to them i i see i because i teach in a medical college and i see a medical student not knowing the importance of visual examination of sputum which is very very important like if it was whitish mucoid uh, since how many days it has become yellowish or purulent or has uh, some blood streak or is greenish in nation is very very important and it does help in uh, we understanding the duration and the severity thank you dr sweta uh, so uh, i would like to say that knowing your disease is very very important like what pathophysiology is uh, for which you are doing your previous strategies whether because that will help you to decide what strategy you want to uh, do and which one do you want to combine and another technical point i want to add is that all this bronchodilation before uh, going for your airway clearance and if you are using inhaled antibiotics that should be all given after that so that uh, may not lead to bronchoconstriction and may lead to your airway clearance tickets so this point uh, can also be taken in uh, your mind going for these things thank so, you so sincere sincere thanks for all of your participation so as kulbi sir was mentioning role of physiotherapist and as uh, murgyan was mentioning empathy and holistic approach is very very important dr ajay was mentioning very clearly early initiation of treatment early identification of exacerbation is very crucial and uh, sweta finally said precision clinic is what is probably in the future has for these patients so precision clinic essentially means okay well goal directed so what is this patient is going to be perfectly benefited with which kind of pharmacotherapy and which which kind of airway clearance technique so that kind of pressure probably is what our uh, patients requires to uh, make them better from um, uh, such a kind of muco obstructive or muco muco occlusive diseases and I sincerely thanks cca for having all of us here and then uh, for uh, uh, close to 2000 logins we are really honored and humbled and um, we pledge to you our participants that cca continues to so really high in um, in future as well to deliver much much very interesting clinically important topics as we have delivered today 
and uh, sincerely thank lupin for uh, uh, being partner of uh, cci for such wonderful academic uh, platform particularly i need to mention regarding hirak bhai late in the night mid middle of the night till 12 o'clock also he strived hard to coordinate for this webinar to materialize thank you dr raj uh, mr raja ganguli and the the team as well and um, it is very very important to mention our core people that is our backbone of cca webinar uh, miss bijal and vinod amit team they work relentlessly to materialize these wonderful academic events with this shubhratri thank you see you next thursday with another wonderful topic thank you so much thank, thank you so much